These little things are more powerful and more versatile than a lot of photographers give them credit for. They're well suited to a variety of tasks, but there are situations where they come up short. Let's talk about it. There was a time when I didn't really know how to use my flash. I put it on the camera and let ETTL do its thing. I knew early on I wanted a more refined look to my photography, one that looked like what I thought professional photography was supposed to look like, but I didn't know how to get there. I took an on-camera bounce flash workshop with a photographer whose work I respected, someone who knew how to get the most out of that setup. I still use those techniques depending on the space I'm in, but to achieve the look I really wanted, I realized I had to learn off-camera flash. Using on-camera bounce is a great technique that I recommend anyone new to photography learn, not only because you only need one flash to do it, and one flash might be all you have, but with experience you can do a lot with this technique. There are some limitations like the color of the walls or ceiling you're bouncing off of, which can add a color cast to your photos, and how to handle bouncing off of surfaces that are further away. People more skilled with that technique than I might be more adept in those situations. For me, I kept coming back to the answer that the look I wanted was off-camera flash. Fortunately, you can still do OCF with only one flash. You do need a transmitter on the camera to send a signal to the off-camera flash that's floating off somewhere else. Uh, there are many options for dedicated transmitters that allow you to do this. Or you can use a second flash to act as a transmitter with the off-camera flash being the receiver. Uh, personally, I like doing it this way because it gives you a second flash to either use as a backup, or you can use off-camera together with on-camera bounce, with one being the main light and the other being a fill. When I started with off-camera flash, I first noticed the biggest difference with family portraits. It gave me the professional look I was after, and I was able to more easily control color casts from tungsten lights installed in churches. Using a bare, unmodified flash gives you a harder look to the light, which I don't find as pleasing for family portraits. So the easiest modifier to get when you're building an off-camera setup is an umbrella. I made a whole other video about them. They're inexpensive and versatile, and I still use them depending on the room I'm in for portraits. Just remember that if you're going to use an umbrella outside, have an assistant hold on to the light stand because the latest breeze will bring the whole setup to the ground and leave you with teeny tiny flash pieces you'll have to pick up. From there, you can start adding additional speed lights to your setup. Maybe you're using one as a main light and the other as a backlight or rim light. Maybe you're using two flashes in front of the subject at different powers to soften shadows. Now you're starting to get into setups that give you a lot more options for different lighting patterns. Then maybe you'll want to experiment with other kinds of modifiers. Let's say a softbox so you can control the direction of light better than you can with an umbrella, which throws light everywhere. Um, and if you put a grid on that softbox, you can focus the light even more. You can also zoom the flash head to create a tighter beam of light. If you're photographing larger groups, you can set it to 24 millimeters or 35 millimeters. But if you're focusing on one or two people, you can zoom it into 50 or 80 or what have you and have a more tightly focused beam of light. Uh, this light gets a bit more intense when you zoom the flash head, so you can soften that with your modifier of choice. There are different ways to balance your flashes with the ambient light, both inside and outside, but that might be something to get more specific instruction on. There are videos all over YouTube that can help you with that, or maybe there's a workshop happening in your area where you can learn directly from an instructor. I currently have six Canon speed lights, and I use them all. For reception lighting, I usually have a two-light off-camera setup on the dance floor, with a third light on a mobile stand I walk around with. Then I have two more speed lights, one on top of each of the two cameras I'm shooting with as transmitters for the off-camera flashes, and then a spare one in case one of them stops working for whatever reason. And sometimes they do. If you can have backup gear like that, I think it's a good idea. If you're getting paid to do a job, you need the tools to get the job done regardless of the situation. For years, I used a multi-speed light setup if I was doing portraits outside, with the intent being to overpower the sun. And that worked fine until it didn't. As versatile as speed lights can be, sometimes you find yourself in a situation where they're just not powerful enough. Uh, for me, that moment was one particular wedding doing family portraits at high noon in the full sun. Traditionally, that time of the day with the sun directly overhead is one we try to avoid. The sun casts harsh shadows and you need more power to balance lighting people properly, filling in the shadows of their faces while exposing the background properly. Here in western Massachusetts, there are venues that overlook the valley with mountains behind them. It's very common for couples to choose venues with the scenery, especially in the fall when the leaves are changing colors. To me, if a couple is choosing that kind of venue, it's important they're able to see that in the photographs. If we're fortunate to have an overcast day and clouds turn the entire sky into one big softbox, you have a much easier go of it than if you have direct sun. We often don't have control over the timeline of someone's wedding day, so you have to be able to perform at any time with whatever nature gives you. Here, I knew how to balance the light, I just couldn't get enough power out of those flashes to fill in the shadows and still render the background properly. 
ultimately you have to make some compromises in these situations and do what you can with the exposure and post-production with masks and such. But when you know how to do it in camera and you have the correct gear, you'll never have to be afraid of intense overhead light like that again. I vowed to never find myself in that situation again, so I did what any photographer with gear acquisition syndrome would do. I bought a big old Pelican case and filled it with all kinds of lights and modifiers I could use to overpower the sun. I watched a bunch of videos here on YouTube where people put different product lines from different manufacturers and head-to-head -head comparisons for performance and features. I ultimately found what seemed like the perfect fit for me, which was the Godox line of lighting. I want to clarify that I'm not sponsored by Godox nor any other brand, but I am available. For my big main light, I picked up an AD600 Pro. This thing is a beast and performs incredibly well. I was at another venue with a view of the valley and the mountains, and I was at like F9 for the background in the early afternoon. These were larger groups, so I had to pull the light back a little bit, so I was at full power for about 20 minutes. This strobe didn't miss a beat. It did take a little longer to recharge for the next shot as I got toward the end of that session, but that's why I have a backup battery I keep charged. I also picked up two AD200s. I can use these as main lights if I'm not shooting in the full sunlight, and I'll also use them with the AD600 as accent lights or rim lights. I have used them to overpower the sun, but because they're inherently less powerful with smaller batteries, the recycle time is far greater at that power. So if you're going to be shooting that way for any length of time, you'll find you'll have to swap out the battery. Whereas the AD600 has surprisingly fast recycle times, even at higher power. I usually use an Octabox, an octagonal softbox, as a modifier on the AD600. Though, as I mentioned, I'll sometimes still use an umbrella. With the AD200s as accent lights, I might just use bare flash. Or maybe I'll use a grid or add a colored gel or something else that fits the look I want to create for that particular portrait or scene. Can any of these lights do high-speed sync? Why, yes, all of them can. From the smaller speed lights to these larger strobes, each of them are capable of being used that way. What is high-speed sync? Maybe that's something I'll make a video about one day. Leave a comment below if that's something you're interested in. If all of this seems overwhelming, well, it can be. When I was first learning lighting, all of this was over my head. Even one flash was daunting, so I did what a lot of people do. I left the flash in the bag and called myself a natural light photographer. Natural light photography can be beautiful, but it is its own skill set. Just because you're not using flash doesn't mean you're a natural light photographer. I mean, maybe technically, but there is a finesse and precision to using natural light or ambient light. And that's important to know if that's the route you'd like to go down. I certainly didn't know it at the time. I learned how to use on-camera flash and then off-camera flash, first by trial and error and then by personal instruction at workshops. There are more options available to us now with YouTube, and I find these resources valuable even today. I'm someone who learns by watching someone do something and then having the opportunity to ask questions. These days I've reached a certain point in my career and have found myself in all kinds of lighting situations over the past 30 years. I've occasionally had the opportunity to help people with their own lighting journey. As it happens, a friend of mine and I are hosting an off-camera lighting workshop May 11th, 2024. It's the day before Mother's Day, so you can come to the workshop and then the next day go tell your mom all the cool things you learned. It's being put on by my friend Ryan Williams of Four Wings Photography and I, and it's being held at Wisteria Hearst Museum in Holyoke, Massachusetts from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. We're not doing this as any huge money-making venture. We're only charging $20. But we'd like to do this kind of thing more and help out people who have asked us to either coach them or mentor them, and we thought this was a good way to start doing that. So if you want to come get your education on, I'll leave a link below to the Eventbrite page where you can register. There's an FAQ there that might answer some of your initial questions. We only have so many spaces available, and because I post these videos on Wednesdays, there's only two or three days left to register depending on what time of day I post this. We've been putting a lot of work into this, and we're trying to cram a lot of information into those two and a half hours, including a section on high-speed sync. So if you want to spend that time with us and hopefully be entertained as well as educated, we'd love to see you there. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. That really does help with the YouTube algorithm. Do you have any on or off camera lighting stories of your own? If so, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to see more videos with more stories, check out this other one I made for you. This is Ask a Wedding Photographer. I'm Seth Kay, and I'm here to help.